you. The, the other part of that story, it's a little bit embarrassing, but you know, they, so many people during the first part of the day talked about my work. It was really like over the top. So during the lunch break, they quick uh, made a new logo. They, ha they had the logos on the video screens for the whole time, and instead of the SANS Threat Hunting uh, Summit, I forgot what it was, Threat, threat Hunting and Incident Response Summit, they renamed it officially to the SANS Threat Hunting and David J. Bianco Summit. <laughs> so, yeah, I've never had a, an event actually named after me before. I hope never to have one again. <laughs> The dad joke summit, yes. D Doug is very, very happy about my dad jokes. And so I actually had one ready for you, Doug. All right, you ready? Look at him. All right, we all know the drama, right? Like, we all know that six was afraid of seven because seven, seven, eight, nine. But the question is not, we have established the facts of the case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, but the motivation he heard that he had to eat three squared meals a day. So. Yeah, yeah. You guys take that much better than my kids did. <laughs> anyway, I really want to thank Doug and Phil, the whole Security Onion team for organizing this and, and for inviting me to speak. I didn't actually apply to this conference. I actually applied to speak at B-Sides but uh, I guess, yeah, so I really thank you. It, with the exception of whoever handed me all these losing tickets this morning. <laughs> right? All right. <laughs> Let there be slides. All right. Anyway, I, that, was a, that was a really good introduction. I'm sorry there will be no Pyramid of Pain content today nor tomorrow at, at my talk at B-Sides. Um, we, can, we can have pyramid talk over sodas or beers or whatever, anytime. I'm always down to talk about the pyramid. Um, it turns out, I guess we're still a little bit ahead of schedule, so I have all the time in the world. I'm gonna, like in the grand tradition of um, your favorite internet recipe sites, I'm gonna start by telling you my entire life story. I was born as a young baby and it really went downhill from there. <laughs> no, for real. Um, I want to talk today about some work that I and my team uh, at Splunk have been putting out. It's, first of all, though, this is a talk about threat hunting. How many threat hunters in the room? Okay, quite a, quite a lot. Um, who in, in this room is using some kind of threat hunting framework? In their, in their work. Anybody? The squirrel thread hunting framework or Tahiti, anything like that? Okay, I'm not seeing any individual hands. So, okay, good. We're gonna talk about thread hunting frameworks today. This is either gonna be epic or, what's the opposite of epic? <laughs> also epic, but in the other way. <laughs> So I want to talk to you today about something that my team just published called the Peak Threat Hunting Framework. Um, before I get into that, I mean, this slide technically is a little bit about myself, but like you can see, I'm terrible at introducing myself and I really don't like it. So let me just talk about my team. I work as a security researcher on the Surge research team at Splunk. Anybody familiar with Surge? Yeah, a few people, okay. Our job basically is to do cybersecurity research for the benefit of the community. We don't really focus on product, so we use Splunk products, but we are not like researching Splunk products or Splunk anything really. Like tomorrow, for example, I'm talking about another research project that I did. Um, that of course uses Splunk in the background and you'll probably see some Splunk screenshots, but it's not about Splunk. That's the best part of my job is I get to research whatever I want. 
So one of the things that I wanted to do when I came to Splunk was I wanted to advance some of the work that I'd already done in threat hunting. And so uh, out of that work was, uh, came the peak threat hunting framework. I should say right up front, it's not only my work, it's the work of myself and my team, uh, especially the co-creator, Dr. Ryan Fetterman. And um, we also have another substantial contributor. Her name is Sydney Marone. So thanks to those uh, especially, but tons of people have helped us get it published, reviewed things, giving us feedback and ideas. So uh, I don't want to say that I'm the, the creator of Peak, but it was a real team effort. And, but I, I did lead that project and I was so fortunate to be able to do that. What is a threat hunting framework? Like, okay, you sit down to do some threat hunting. What do you do? How do you get started? Do you just like start typing some Splunk commands or searches in Elastic or, you know, security onion searches, whatever? Probably not. I mean, maybe. That might not be the best way to start, but sure. A threat hunting framework is kind of a, think of it as a, a, a mental model. Like the pyramid of pain is, is a mental model, right? But a framework is actually a little bit more than that because it has to help you understand and think about a lot of different things. For example, hey, what kind of things are there? What kind of hunts are there that I could even do? Like different techniques or different types of uh, hunt processes. And if there are multiple ones that might apply, how do I figure out which ones are the most useful or the best suited for the thing that I'm trying to find in my network right now? Um, once I'm done, what should I expect the results to look like? Like, what am I going to produce? Like, what are my deliverables, my outputs? And how do I figure out not only if that hunt was a success, but how do I figure out not just the individual hunt, but if my hunting program is being a success. The answer, it turns out, to all of these things comes down to one question. Why am I even hunting in the first place? Not just why am I hunting for whatever this thing is, but what is the point of threat hunting? What is, I'm gonna ask you, what is the point of threat hunting? Who has an answer? To find a threat, okay. To find someone, something that's active in our network. Anything else? Yes. To find the threats that my detections miss. That is someone who has listened to my definition. Uh, yes. What else? Anything? To, to prove the detection use case. These are all good reasons but they may not be the best way, the best way to think about it. When I started threat hunting, I don't even remember exactly when it was, but you know, 2010-ish or something, um, how it started was we wanted to find incidents. That was the goal of threat hunting. I will tell you right up front that my thoughts on this have changed substantially multiple times but that is still probably the most popular thing that people say, like the most common thing people say about why they hunt. They hunt to find more security incidents. Okay, that works. The Problem with that though, is that if you're relying on humans to find your security incidents, it's, it's not scalable. It is very difficult to say, well, we're gonna have a human review all these logs on a regular basis to find incidents. You might f find it because you hunted it this week, but next week, unless you're hunting it again, it's probably not gonna be found, right? And we are very expensive compared to computing. So it's also inefficient. Um, when I started talking more publicly about threat hunting in about 2015, uh, you, some of you may remember, I used to work for a, a threat hunting vendor called Squirrel, and we put out what basically was the first threat hunting framework that I'm aware of, 
Uh, we called it, we didn't call it a framework back then, we called it the squirrel threat hunting cycle and there was all things that went with it. But one of the key messages was that you shouldn't be hunting just to find incidents, you should actually be hunting to improve your automated detection so that you don't have to find, you know, spend expensive human time finding those incidents again. Like it was research and development almost for new automated detection mechanisms. And at the time, I thought, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. This is great. I don't consciously sit around thinking I'll never improve upon this, but you know, I didn't really think that there was anything more to it. But when I came to Splunk and, and I started, honestly, I, uh, I started noticing that we don't market ourselves as a threat hunting platform even though we're really good at it. Sorry, that's as close as I'll come to marketing or sales. Uh, but I, I wanted to do the same thing we did at Squirrel, which was we put out totally vendor and product agnostic technical threat hunting how-tos and tutorials um, just to improve the general level of threat hunting in the, in the cybersecurity community in the industry. And I wanted to do that again, and I kind of sat down and I said, well, what would I do different? Like if I were just now creating a new framework or a new message around threat hunting, what would I do different? I tried as far as I, uh, possible to go back to first principles. And what I realized was over the years between 30, 15 or so when I published the squirrel stuff and late last year when I started this, I had actually learned a lot about threat hunting. And I don't only mean how to do threat hunting, like the technical pieces uh, of how it works. I mean of how it is applied. Sorry, I'm messing up the camera <laughs> while my, all my walking. And so what I, what I started this framework off with was a new premise. Threat hunting is not just to find incidents, and it's not just to improve your automated detection. Threat hunting is about improving everything, your entire security posture for your whole enterprise. Threat hunting is an ideal driver of continuous improvement across the entire security organization. And after I realized that, kind of everything else in the framework builds on that. And I won't say it just fell in place because it was a little bit more than that, but definitely I think you'll see as we go through the framework, almost everything in the framework is aligned to driving some kind of improvement in a, a different part of your environment. I will tell you another story. Some of you may know that I used to work before I came to Splunk, I had another job. Yeah, that's probably not a big deal. Um, at this other job, they had an existing threat hunting program when I got there. And they, their program was basically they would, they would hunt on topics for a week. They would come with an ad hoc team, they would get together, do threat hunting for a week, and then disband, and then the next week a different ad hoc team would come together and do it. And, and better than not doing it at all, but there were some things that I noticed, especially when I was um, eventually took over running that program for the last few years I was there. There were some things that I noticed that it was causing some issues. You can't just sit down at a pile of data and start hunting and deciding that you're gonna have some kind of good outcome. That's not gonna work. There's actually a little bit more to do it to, to do than that. I call that phase where you're actually working with the data and doing the analysis, that's the execute phase. You're executing, but what are you executing? You need a plan. You need to spend some time doing research on your topic, whatever you're hunting for. How does it normally look in your environment? In, um, what are the associated techniques that you might also see along with it? How, you know, what are the 
five different ways that this tactic could be executed so that you can find these things. What data is available to you from, that you're collecting in your environment and how do you get access to it? And what do you need to do to that data in order to find the thing that you're trying to find? So there's this whole prepare phase. And also, yeah, you do the preparation and you do the hunt execution, and then what? You just forget about it and go on to the next thing, right? No worries. No, that's not what you do. You have to take some action on what you found. You have to document it. You have to communicate the results. If there are incidents that you have to open, you need to open them. But there may be other things that you need to do, which we'll talk about shortly as well. So when I was there, the, one of the first things I did when I took over running the hunting program is I stopped hunting week by week. We actually, uh, at that location, at that, that time, I had a three week cycle instead of a one week cycle. The first week was prepare, the second week was execute, and the third week was act and follow up. We didn't really call them that then, but that's what we were doing. It was exactly that reason. Um, you will see the P, E, and A in peak threat hunting framework. Every kind of threat hunt that we have that aligns to this prepare, execute, and act. But um, I did have to add something else because I really did not want to be the guy who went out and <laughs> talked about the P threat hunting framework. So, so, but it occurred to me as we were trying to think of like, how could I make this acronym not embarrassing? That the other piece was, that I was missing was the knowledge. Because there, at every phase, you have some knowledge. When you're preparing, you have knowledge about the threat actor tactics, but also about your own environment. The, that's what you use to make that hunting plan. Um, when you're executing, you're taking that knowledge, your knowledge of the data, what, if you already have existing like baselines or detections uh, for this similar type of stuff in your environment, you're taking that knowledge and combining it to do your analysis. And of course, when you get into the act phase, you are taking what knowledge you gained as a threat hunter and making sure that the rest of the organization can benefit from it and that it is not lost. So prepare, execute, and act with knowledge, the peak threat hunting framework. As part of peak, we have developed detailed process diagrams and descriptions that cover three different types of threat hunting. And by the way, I see people taking pictures. That's fine, take, please take pictures of these, but um, it turns out you won't need to. I will tell you why at the end. Uh, we've published all this publicly though, so it's, it is easy to reference. In fact, I'm not gonna try to walk through every piece of this diagram. If you wanna know what they all mean, you can look at our, our, uh, our publications, or you can buy me a beer, whichever. The first of these is hypothesis-driven hunting, and that is probably what most people are familiar with. Like, I spent a lot of time in 2015 making, making this, like, the standard hunt type. Another thing that I kind of missed was, like, there's other, other types of hunts, and we ended up doing those other types of hunts all the time, but I just never really wrote them down. So most people now think of threat hunting as all hypothesis driven, which is not entirely true, but it still is one of the major three types. So where you start off with some kind of idea about something that might be going on in your network, and you figure out, given the data that you have, and the analysis techniques that you know how to do, or that you're willing to learn, you figure out how to find that and verify that hypothesis or disprove the hypothesis maybe. At the end of that though, if you've successfully, successfully either 
proved or disproven your hypothesis, you have a mechanism that you used to detect that activity. Whether or not it was present, you don't control the threat actors. You're not the boss of me. Um, so you may have then some valuable, um, some valuable insights on how to detect this on your own network that you can turn into automated detections. I, it's probably a long shot, but this is something I published a few years ago. And I, I say published, actually I tweeted about it. It took me like 15 minutes or 20 minutes and then that was it for a long time. But now the peak threat hunting framework also includes what I call the able framework, as in are you able to hunt this hypothesis? The able framework consists of four different things. Look at me, I'm going four different things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> four different things. The actor, the behavior, the location, and the evidence. You, you, these are the things that you need to define as part of your planning and preparation so that you can ensure that you have a successful hunt execution. The actor is the optional part. There, in some cases, you're hunting a behavior that is well known to be associated with a certain threat actor or maybe a certain kind of threat actor like you know, ransomware actors or hacktivists or something like that. And knowing the actor or maybe the kind of actor might give you some extra clues like other associated uh, behaviors that they exhibit before or after or during the type of behavior you're trying to find, maybe some indicators or common tool sets that they use or something like that. So it's optional sometimes, a lot of times you'll be hunting something that just applies so broadly to all the actors that it doesn't really matter. But if you have more context about specific actors or types of actors, note that down because you're gonna need it for your planning. Now the B in ABLE, happen, the B in ABLE, yeah, the B in the ABLE framework uh, stands for behavior, and that is what is are you what are you hunting for? What are the threat actors doing that you need to find? And it could be oh I'm gonna do I'm looking for DNS exfiltration via tunneling, something like that. That's the behavior, and there may be even more specific versions of that that you can note like uh, via tunneling using DNS text records, for example, or tunneling encoding everything into the domain names. The location is where on your network you need to collect evidence in order to find this thing. Or the other way of saying it is where on your network, if this were happening, would it probably be happening? It could be simple, could be like, perimeter versus internal, or it could be more targeted, like this would probably only show up on our internet-facing mail servers. And this will help you figure out where you need to collect data from. Even, like, for example, maybe you've determined that you're probably gonna need um, you know, host logs, like uh, Windows process logs, but don't, collect them from your whole network if you only need them on those internet facing, what I say, mail servers, internet facing mail servers. And the E is the evidence. The evidence is a combination of what data do I collect that could possibly show me this, this type of uh, behavior and what does it look like in that data if the behavior is occurring. This you, this is where you might, in your planning, you might try to see what other organizations that have detections or maybe have published hunts, what kind of data they look at in order to look at those. Uh, you might even sometimes stage some of this activity in like a test lab to observe the artifacts in the, in the logs. So between the actor, behavior, location, and evidence, you can take your 
hypothesis and slowly break it down into pieces so that you have everything that you need in order to combine all those things into making a plan. And you will see, like, Abel is right around here, scoping the hunt, and, and kind of overlaps with the plan as well, because sometimes as you are creating Abel, you naturally, at the end of it, are like, well, dang it, I have a plan now. I didn't realize that I got that far, but it happens. So that's hypothesis-driven hunting. The two others that we defined are kind of new to, to this framework. Um, to my knowledge, I won't say that nobody's ever done these types before, but to my knowledge, they've never been written down as a cohesive thing. It's like, here's the three types of threat hunts. Um, the second one is baseline hunting. I think Dave Kennedy, I think, mentioned this earlier today. Find out what's normal on your network and then look for the deviations from normal that might indicate malicious or at least suspicious activity. And that is entirely what we're doing with baseline hunting. Baseline hunting, you're going to take probably your, who remembers their high school statistics class? <laughs> well, I'm sorry for all of you uh, that don't, because it's basically descriptive statistics for your environment. Like you would do a baseline hunt in, well, you could do it anytime, but you would most commonly do it when you were onboarding a new data source, like your data engineers just brought you a new pile of logs, first thing before you can really go do any kind of threat hunting in there is you have to be familiar with that data source. So a great way to do that is to just go through the baselining process. Find out what's in there and what the, the common values are or the ranges of values. Um, you might do things like computing the, the min and the max and the median or you know, there's all kinds of stuff or just creating a, a list of all the things that, all the fields that are in there and all the com most common values, you'll see them. That is what we call the data dictionary. It has a little bit more, a little bit different definition than you might have learned in software engineering class, but it's similar type of thing. In this log source, <clears throat> what are all the fields? Or at least, what are all the fields that are most relevant to security? And what are the common values or uh, ranges of values or whatever? And then once you have that, you can look through that same data again to find the things that are most out of whack with the commonalities. Because maybe those things that are most out of whack are something that you should look into. They could be mis misconfigurations, but they could also be something more sinister. The third type is what we call model-assisted threat hunting. And this is where, another one of those things where, like, my team has been, had been doing this in that previous employer. We just didn't have a name for it. Think of model-assisted threat hunting, or as we like to call it, math. It is like data science applied to incident detection. That is where you might bring in some, I don't know, clustering algorithms or visualizations to help you understand the distribution of data. You might bring in some classifiers from machine learning or some, uh, some kind of like outlier detection algorithms, all kinds of like data science-y stuff. Dare I say, you might employ some AI <laughs> is it okay if I told my boss you said that? <laughs> he said, take my money. So, yeah. Um, so these are the three types. Hypothesis-driven, which I think ever, you know, most people familiar with threat hunting have already known. But also baseline and, and model-assisted hunting, which people have been doing but we haven't really talked about them as legitimate modes of threat hunting. So we put all these three things together and these are the, th the basic three types 
that peak, um, peak defines. But that's not all. So I told you some ways to do some threat hunts. Great. I could have stopped there, I guess. But over the years, I've had a lot of people ask me a lot of questions. Because I, like, basically, the squirrel threat hunting cycle did stop there. Like, OK, we had a hypothesis. We proved it. We disproved it, whatever. So with Peak, I tried to answer some of those additional questions that people have asked me and incorporate them into the framework. And the first thing is, OK, we have a hunt. What are the outputs of a hunt or the key deliverables that probably almost every hunt should have? I, I initially came up with four, although newer versions of Peak uh, actually have a fifth one in here. Um, those are, yeah, security incidents. Everyone knows hunting produces security incidents sometimes, right? It's terrible if you measure the success about threat hunting about, uh, uh, according to the number of incidents that you have, but we'll talk about that later. But it does produce incidents. So that's a key output. You may not always have it, but if you, you know, you're likely to have them on any of your given threat hunts. The other thing is hunt documentation. Like when you do a threat hunt, it is not really good if you just forget everything you did and how you did it. You really need to spend some time talking about like and writing down this was the process I used. This was the data I consumed. This, these were the analytic techniques that I used. These, maybe even, these were the analytic techniques I tried using, but I couldn't. Or these were the data sources that I wanted to get, but I couldn't. Because there are many times when you're going to want to hunt for the same thing again in the future. Maybe just to make sure that, you know, technology drift hasn't made your automated detections uh, go off target. Uh, maybe, maybe because you, you weren't able to get a fully automated detection the first time and you wanted to come back and try again. Or even maybe uh, you're looking not for that same thing, but something similar to it and you want to adapt what you already did. So you need to have a good hunt documentation. It could be as simple as a wiki page. I've seen people do it in like ticketing systems like JIRA or something like that. It doesn't really matter how you do it as long as what, you know, you capture what you did, how you did it, and hopefully even some of the missteps that you made so you won't have to spend time on those again next time. The third of the big major pieces is, of course, detections, automated detections. Like now you've figured out how to hunt for something, Let's try to turn those into automation so you don't have to hunt for it again every time just to see if there's you know, new occurrences of that uh, behavior. And I, I have a whole other section actually on that, so we're gonna skip that a little bit. The fourth here is the, is the communications piece, the briefings and reports to your stakeholders. Let them know what you have been doing. It, it does not do you very much good and it certainly doesn't do your organization very much good if you cannot com let anybody else know what you found. And I don't just mean, hey, talk to your, report it to your manager or your SOC director or the, your detection engineering team. I mean like you hunted on the email servers. Let's bring the email team in and let them know what you found or didn't find, right? Uh, you're doing Windows hunts. Let's bring the system administration team for Windows in, and maybe, maybe they will say, no thanks. <laughs> maybe they will be much more interested. In our experience, uh, we found that there was a big interest from people about threat hunting, because like threat hunting is kind of sexy, it's a little bit mysterious if you don't do it on a regular basis. So yeah, they were interested in in the process, but they're also interested in what you found on their systems that they're responsible for. Uh, so definitely briefings, reports, email updates, whatever, to get the word out about your findings. 
And the, the fifth one that I would say um, is, is ideas for future hunts. Like, there's a lot of times when I've gone through a threat hunt and there's a rabbit hole I really want to go down, but if I do that, I won't be able to accomplish my actual mission. So write those down. They become part of your slush pile of future hunt ideas. A good hunter will never run out of things to hunt for because they probably have a big slush pile. Now I said I was gonna talk a little bit about detections, automated detections. Another thing that I've learned over the years since I started the squirrel hunting cycle is that there's automated detections and then there's automated detections. We go through this whole process of threat hunting and I've already said we don't wanna have to hunt everything every time over and over again because it's inefficient. But sometimes we can't just be like, I found a new way to make a 100% reliable alert, right? So I kind of break down the detections into four big buckets. And they're ordered from the bottom up according to how much human effort they need to review the outputs or to review the, the potential, I can't say alerts because they're not all alerts. The bottom two actually don't alert at all. The top two alert. The bottom one here is uh, number four is a report. A lot of times we'll hunt something and we'll be like in the right ballpark, but it's not good enough that we could just feel confident sending it off to the SOC. We have a list of candidate incident or, or candidate events that might indicate that whatever we hunted for was happening, but lots and lots of like false positives or benign true positives. And so it still needs a human analyst to read each one in the report and make a judgment for each, which is very, still pretty expensive, less expensive than doing the hunt over again. It's, uh, you know, from scratch, but still pretty expensive. So you might schedule this to run every day, week, month, however, whatever's uh, appropriate. And then you have to figure out a way to make sure somebody read it and, and took action on it if necessary. Like, we, I think almost all of us in this room probably agree that if you, if you emailed it out to the entire SOC, it will never get read. Because everybody will probably think everyone else is reading it, right? So you might need to put in a ticket or, or something to make sure that it gets assigned to someone and they can mark, yes, I did this. Um, if you do it right, it won't take them too long, especially after they've gone through this report a few times and they're a little bit familiar with it, but it still does take some processing load. Uh, and I mean mental processing load, not computer processing. The next level up is probably dashboards or visualizations. It's not individual event level, it's roll up statistics or maybe graphics that could help you easily identify where something went wrong. Like, we, who, who has uh, dashboards on the wall on their sock and a big video display, yeah? It's kind of like that. Again, somebody has to look at it. You have to make sure somebody's looking at it on a regular basis, but it takes a little bit less cognitive load than, than the individual events in their report, hopefully. When we come to the top two levels, that's where things start to really get interesting. Level two is something that I just, I, I just made the name of. Uh, it's an, I call it analytics in code. That is, I need to do usually a little bit of like computation that I can't do in whatever my, my detection platform or my sim is. So I need maybe bring it out bring the data out, um, do it in Python maybe, in a Jupyter Notebook or something. A lot of times if you're doing threat hunting in a Jupyter Notebook, you can just uh, take a version of that and, and clean out all the things that didn't work <laughs> and, and say now I have a analytics and code notebook and then export the code and 
you have to have some way to make it run, but ideally the output of your analytics will be something that's alert quality that you could then insert an alert into the queue and the SOC analyst could process it along with everything else. At that point, the SOC analyst doesn't have that much more mental load than any other alert. Um, it may be a little bit more work from the engineering side to make sure you have a platform that you can run this code and run it reliably on the schedule, but still. And then of course, right at the tippy top, uh, signatures and rules, depending on your exact uh, SIM or other detection platform, some can take only kind of basic signatures and rules. Some can take um, more complicated comp computational things. So whether an alert is a signature or analytics and code kind of depends on your tool set. But again, at, right at the top, you just, you, you put it in your IDS or you put it in your SIM and it just works forever. You don't have to schedule it. You don't have to manage it that much, at least no more than you do all your other rules. So this is, I call this the hierarchy of detection outputs. And it is a total coincidence that it is also a pyramid. <laughs> it just turns out that for whatever reason, these, these, these PowerPoint and, and slides vendors, they just don't do well <laughs> on new visualizations for hierarchies. So the, the hierarchy of detection outputs is a piece in peak that helps you now that you've completed your hunt, you're in the act phase, how do I turn this into automated detection? It can give you some guidance about what the most appropriate type of detection might be based on your, how reliable your outputs or your findings will be. Another big piece is, remember I said, how do you know if, you've, if everything's been working right? How do you know success? Not even just success for a hunt, because you usually know success for an individual hunt. Yes, I figured out how I would have found something. It wasn't present, but that's okay. Or it was present and we found it. But this, more than anything else, ties back to that idea of Threat hunting should be about continuous improvement elsewhere. I've had so many people over the years ask me, how do you create effective metrics over threat hunting? And at first I was very puzzled by this too. But a few years ago I went to, I, I can't remember if it was the SANS CTI summit or maybe the first CTI summit but I saw a presentation um, where there was just like one magic slide. It was about metrics and I didn't really expect to be interested, I'll be honest. But the magic slide was, you have two choices with metrics. You can measure how much work you did or you can measure how effective your work was. When I realized that like years ago, I was like, I started to see how I could answer that question for threat hunting. If our goal is continuous improvement across the entire organization, then our metrics have to reflect that. So, in, you know, those threat hunters here, how many of you have, have metrics that say how many incidents you opened from your hunts? Yeah, I see some hands, I'm very sorry for you. Um, because I happen to think that's a bad way. At least it's bad if, you're, if that's the only thing you're doing. Because you don't, like I said, you don't control the threat actors. You might have a great way of finding their activity, but they didn't do that activity in your window, so you know, don't get, you shouldn't be penalized for that. So what I came up with was a set of five metrics. I, I think of these as the core, and I kind of expect other, you know, every organization will have additional ones that they will add, but these are the, probably the big five that most organizations probably want to, to track. The first one is the number of new detections that you created as a result of your hunting, or the number of existing cre uh, detections that you updated to make them better somehow. 
right there, that shows continuous improvement in your automated detection. So track that and report it on whatever schedule, monthly, quarterly, whatever. The second is, it is incidents opened, but there's a big, I don't know, a, a big twist here. Not just incidents opened while you were hunting. When you are hunting, even if you don't find anything, that's fine. You created those detections or you updated those detections. Mark down which detections were a result of your threat hunts. When you later open incidents as a result of alerts or reports or whatever that you created, those count toward your metric of incidents opened because those are incidents that you never would have found if you had not created those automated detections from your threat hunting. So it's totally legit to claim them. And in fact, if you don't claim them, you're only getting the worst part of that detection picture. The next two are kind of similar, uh, so maybe we'll do them at the, at the same time. The, the visibility gaps that you noticed, like this is data that I wanted, but it wasn't available to me or it was corrupted, or it wasn't parsed correctly in the sim, so I couldn't use it, or I had to do all this extra work to it to make it usable. And, and also vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. As threat hunters, we are often poking into things that no one has poked into in a while. And whenever you poke into new things, you're going to, things are gonna poke back, basically. Um, you know, you're gonna find things were wrong that nobody knew were wrong. So record those and in part of the uh, stakeholder communications, report them to their owners. We can't control whether they actually fix them, but we can at least, we can at least report on how many we notified their owners of. We found seven vul um, vulnerabilities or we found three uh, visibility gaps last month and reported them. If you can, you can keep track of which ones were actually actioned. It's not a metric for your team so much, but it does show you, like maybe give you some feedback on which kinds of things that the organization might care about more. And the final thing, it sounds weird, but you know, it might even be the least important is the number of different techniques that you hunted for. Not just the number even, but sometimes like you, you may apply a, another model, like you might apply the MITRE attack framework, even though it's not my favorite way. I think Dave Kennedy also mentioned this, like 100% MITRE attack coverage is dumb and stupid because there's literally things in there that is not meant to be detected, like use of encryption, right? But maybe think of things like, what happens if you were to apply it to the, um, the cyber kill chain? How many techniques did I hunt in each phase last quarter or last year? Or maybe you have your own favorite life cycle model or I did say I wasn't gonna talk about the pyramid of pain, but maybe, like, where on the pyramid are all your hunting things? Hopefully they're at the top, but not all, not all the time. And if they're not, then you would like to probably know about that so you could correct it. So I expect that organizations will have their own metrics that they might add to these, but these are kind of like the core set that I recommend most organizations start with because together these show not just your work, but your, the effect of your work across a lot of different parts of the organization. This is how you tell the story of how the hunt team is providing value and helping the organization increase their security posture. Some of you may have heard this because I just kind of stole it from my previous work. It was my work in the first place, but 
because I think the other key piece is now, you know, we, we've seen all the things that we should produce and the types of hunting and the metrics and whatever. So are we really even a framework though if we don't have a maturity model? I mean, it's like, bro, do you even maturity? Um, <laughs> So I actually created this as part of the squirrel um, threat hunting cycle stuff in 2015, but it's, I think it's still reasonably accurate. A threat hunting maturity model is a way of diagnosing where your entire threat hunting program is on this model, and it's a roadmap to where you might improve. It really, it looks, if you read it closely, it looks like it, it takes into account the data and the analytic techniques that your team is capable of producing or capable of using in threat hunting. Um, and it does, but, it, but both of those have significant like people skill aspects or people expertise aspects to them. So it actually, I think of it as, as a combined one number measurement of the expertise of your people, as well as the amount of data that you have available to you and the types of, of analytic techniques that you're able to bring to bear. It starts off with, and, and this has been extensively documented over the years, so I don't necessarily have to go in detail for each, but it starts off with, you know, all CMMs, uh, they start with zero. You're not doing it at all, that's fine. Uh, HMM1 is n what we call minimal hunting. This is basically indicator search. A lot of people don't believe indicator search is threat hunting, but I always have believed that it is just not very good threat hunting because my original definition was searching for, you know, manual or machine assisted ways of searching for incidents that your automated detections might have missed. And one way that you would do that is to say, well, we now have some new information about a malicious domain or something. I'm gonna search to see if we have ever seen that. Technically fits the threat hunting definition. Not super sophisticated, but it is HMM1 threat hunting. HMM2 is kind of, we call it procedural. It's basically, I, am, I have enough data and enough skills in my team that I am capable of replicating threat hunting that other people have published. I might have to adapt it a little to the exact data that I have because maybe it's a little different uh, or my environment is a little bit different, but I'm basically able to take threat hunts that other people do. Um, I consider that the minimal accepted threat hunting level for most organizations. Like I would, encourage most organizations to go up to HMM3, the main difference is they are then able to create their own new threat hunts. And then at HMM4, leading, you not only are creating your new threat hunts, but you're also, your emphasis on the act phase, you are uh, creating automated detections for most of your hunts. Um, and probably if I were making this up, you know, now, I would say you're probably also uh, doing those other things that we talked about in the metrics and reporting uh, gaps and, and doing those things. But basically that is you are extra successful in the act phase if you are at HMM4, the highest level. Now, Check out our brand new ebook. Yeah, so earlier this, this week, actually, we published the Peak Threat Hunting Framework as a PDF, a free PDF download uh, from the Splunk website. You will have to give them your email address. I'm sorry about that. Um, we have been publishing it since April uh, piecemeal in our blogs. So if you do not wish to get your, give them your email address, you can look at our peak threat hunting blogs, but I highly recommend the ebook because even since we started publishing in April until this week when we published the ebook, um, I've made some, some corrections and updates, things that I left out, nothing terribly large, but uh, you know, significant. Also, their graphics look way better than mine. 
So I definitely recommend the ebook. And there's a bonus section that is, has not been published in the blogs about how to take the peak threat hunting framework and apply it to either a new program that you're building from scratch or maybe an existing one that you may already be using some other model or maybe no model and how to begin to integrate um, peak into your existing hunt operations. So ebook, super proud of my team for getting this out. We actually chose the publication date so that we could say that Security Onion Conference was the first time, I'm not lying, that Security Onion Conference was the first premiere of this book. So this is the first time anyone's ever seen this QR code outside of Splunk, I think. So uh, I encourage you all to check it out. And with that, I guess I have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. No? Okay. Well, oh yeah, I could question. So, yes, Jason. <laughs> Jason's, Jason's having a little bit of fun because uh, actually I was scheduled to pr present this presentation in, um, uh, in, I forgot now when it was, June or July, um, at Splunk's big internal, uh, Splunk's big customer conference, dot conf 23 in Vegas, but uh, as, he, as he knows, I actually tore my Achilles tendon and I wasn't able to walk for like six months, so I had to cancel a, a number of speaking engagements, including this one. So this is the first time I've actually been able to give this presentation in, in, in its entirety to anyone. <laughs> and so I'm super happy to be able to finally give this presentation, so. But it was not a street fight. <laughs> That's just my cover story, because. I can't really tell you how it happened or I'd have to kill you. <laughs> yes, you. Uh, question was, the question <laughs> was, how much does it cost to, <laughs> to use Peak? Because it costs, I guess, to use the pyramid? No, yeah. Now, you know what, uh, in all seriousness, I have had a lot of people come up to me over the years and be like, I would like to use the pyramid in uh, my, my textbook that I'm writing, or my lectures for my class, or it even got, um, at one point, I think this is a professional highlight of my career, maybe it got put into a Jane's Intelligence Journal. Um, and there's, you know, lots of people that are using it and, and they want permission. And sometimes they also, the, their publishers want to know, is there a fee? And it's like, no, there will never be a fee for the use of, of the Pyramid of Pain. And similarly, um, you know, I, I, fight against, I didn't have to fight Splunk too hard, they get it, but I fight against having to, you know, license my work. So Peak is out there. We explicitly created it as vendor neutral and tool agnostic because we wanted people to be able to use it and not just like, oh, it's a threat hunting framework for Splunk users, but I'm not a Splunk user, so I guess I'm out. No, I want it to be used as widely as possible. So you want to cite it Please do just, you know, cite it correctly. This is, you know, David Bianco, Ryan Fetterman, whatever, sir, or just say it's by Splunk or by Surge and, and it'll be fine. Because we want, we encourage people to, to adopt Peak. We encourage people to write about Peak. Um, I just had an article come out today in Security Magazine about Peak threat hunting. So yeah, we, we want to get it out there because my, my sincere hope is I did this because I wanted to help people understand how to do threat hunting better and how it can be, you know, a good threat hunting program could actually impact the security of your organization in a, in a, in a potentially very positive way. 
And so, yeah, it's out there. Please use it. If you don't like it, let me know, because I'm really, <laughs> I'm really curious. Uh, if you do use it, I would love to hear from you. If you don't use it, what's wrong with you? No, I just. <laughs> But seriously, no, please feel free to use it, reference it in your work, adopt it in your organizations. There's no fee. Like, it's not licensed. We just put it out there. Yes? Where does the QR code actually Where does the QR code, oh, do you, well, I don't know the actual URL, <laughs> but it, you'll know because it says like splunk.com something, something peak threat hunting framework dot HTML or something. <laughs> Yeah, there's totally no malware in it. I don't know what you're impugning, sir, what you're implying, but. All right, other questions? Serious question. Serious question? Okay, let's see. Yeah, okay, let me see if I can say that again. So the question is, looking at the hierarchy, going between dashboards and visualizations and analytics and code, is there like a relationship between those two where you might say, oh, this visualization or this dashboard, I this would be a good way, it would be a good candidate for me to convert it to analytics and code. Is that yeah. accurate? Yeah. I actually think, and if you read the peak framework document, you'll see that we talk about when you are at three and four, like reports and dashboards, ideally you would at some point try again because you want to climb a little bit farther up at least until analytics and code, because you want to get to alerts, because your SOC knows how to deal with alerts, I hope. You want to fit it into the existing workflow. That said, sometimes you can't always get there, so you might be stuck at dashboards and visualizations for a little while. I'm not really aware yet of any particular like indicators in a dashboard or a visualization that might make it a better like, oh, if you see this, it's more likely to be able to be turned into analytics or signatures. Um, I, I think of it more like if I use this dashboard a lot, especially if it becomes valuable to me in some way, like more than my other reports or dashboards maybe, that means it's more of a candidate. Maybe you'll do a re-hunt. You will start from where you, you know, take that hunt documentation that I was talking about and redo your hunt. But this time, um, maybe bring in a different set of team members to give some different perspectives or try to find some, some different analytic techniques that you didn't try before and see if you can move up the pyramid there. Uh, I actually said it, I'm sorry, up the hierarchy uh, a little bit uh, because that's, that's my whole, when I die, my epitaph is gonna be like a pyramid-shaped headstone and, and be like, he, he went down the pyramid, I don't know, all the way. All my, pyra all my models are pyramids. Um, so you know, try to try to move up the the, the hierarchy. <laughs> I spent so long talking about moving up the pyramid. I'm just not capable of saying anything else. So yes, that doesn't work. <laughs> What cybersecurity threat do I think poses the greatest risk to our nation's democracy? I am totally unqualified to answer this question. <laughs> I mean, I have some opinions, but those are probably bar opinions or, <laughs> or something. Uh, but I do think that, you know, 
cybersecurity is national security. I totally buy into that. And I know that, you know, people defending democracy, literally defending democracy, use the pyramid of pain. I'm hoping that they will find these things useful too. But yeah, I am totally unqualified to, to answer that question. I am terribly sorry. Did I see another question? Okay, um, I'll be here um, after for a little while and also you can catch me at B-Sides if you think of questions overnight. I'm, I'm speaking again tomorrow on a different topic. So I hope to see all of you there. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you.